And uh, it's a humbling thought. Mark chapter 8, uh, we concluded uh, last Sunday night uh, in Mark chapter 7. We, I love that verse. Uh, they were beyond measure astonished in verse 37. Uh, and saying, He hath done all things well. And He maketh both the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. And uh, boy, does He not do all things well. I'm thankful for that. Mark chapter 8, and uh, we're going to look at verse number 1. And uh, here again we see another feeding, uh, but don't mistake the two. This is a different feeding. Uh, once he fed the, the, the 5,000 men, uh, I think uh, some commentators believe there could have been upwards to uh, 30, 40,000 people there. Some believe maybe twenty to 25,000. They just numbered the men that day for whatever reason. But let's not mistake that. There's some actually believe that this was uh, not a real feeding. They, they, they believe that this was something that Jesus referred back to or, or they doubt that the feeding of the 4,000 ever took place. But I, I believe that it did, of course, according to the Bible. And there is differences. There's 4,000 here total, not just 5,000 men. There was, uh, there was five loaves and two fishes at the other. There's seven loaves and some fishes here. And then there was 12 baskets, uh, uh, fragments remaining at the last feeding, and there's only seven here. So there's distinct differences in the feedings here in Mark chapter 8 and the other uh, chapter that talks about the feeding of the 5,000. Now notice with me in verse number 1. And in those days, the multitude being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus called His disciples unto Him and saith unto them, I have compassion on the multitude because they have now been with me three days and have nothing to to eat. And if I send them away fasting to their own houses, they will faint, by the way, for divers of them came from far. And his disciples answered him, From whence can a man satisfy these men with bread here in the wilderness? You know, you would actually think that the disciples by now would understand that they're with Jesus. And if he did it the first time, these are not different disciples. Uh, I, I'm not sure if they had amnesia. I'm not sure if they were losing it a little bit. But you would think, where, and you can just see him look around saying, Now Jesus, uh, how are you going to feed this crowd when he had done fed way more? And uh, must have been independent Baptist. I'm going to go on. And so he, uh, verse number 5, And he asked them, How many loaves have ye? And they said, Seven. And he commanded the people to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves and gave thanks and break and gave to his disciples to set before them. And they did set them before the people. And they had a few small fishes. And he blessed and commanded to set them also before them. I think it's interesting that Jesus here prays twice. The first time he only prayed one time with the, the other feeding. Notice in verse number 8. And so they did eat and were filled and they took up of the broken meat that was left seven baskets. Verse 9, And they that had eaten were about 4,000, and He sent them away. Now notice verse 10. This is where we pick up this morning. Verse 10, And straightway He entered into a ship with His disciples and came into the parts of Dalmanutha. And the Pharisees came forth and began to question with Him, say, seeking of a sign from heaven, tempting Him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why doth this generation seek after a sign? Verily I say unto you, There shall no sign be given unto this generation. And he left them, entering into a ship again, departed to the other side. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time we have in church this morning. And again, I pray you'll bless the Word. Lord, may it speak to people. May we not just be hearers of the Word, but doers. We ask all these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to preach to you just for a few minutes this morning on don't miss the signs. Don't miss the signs. Just out of really uh, four different verses here in verses 10, 11, 12, and 13. I read a story just the other day about a truck driver who was taking a load of, uh, of, of lumber to a new destination. As he drove, he intently was watching for the signs leading to his exit. And in effort to find the right exit, he actually missed the signs warning him of a low overpass ahead. To his astonishment, his truck became stuck under the overpass. He hit it. Man, he came to a screeching halt. So did the traffic behind him. He could not go forward and he could not back up. He was actually stuck underneath this overpass. 
traffic began to back up for miles and tempers were very flared up and and uh, folks were getting out of their cars and they were upset and the police were called and and then uh, wreckers were summoned in effort to try to free this stuck truck well they uh, they uh, took a uh, they tried trucks they tried uh, grease and pulleys and wedges they tried everything to get this truck uh, from getting out from underneath that overpass and nothing seemed to work and hours passed by and they went into the, the evening time and then the night and boy, a big crowd had done joined them and the workers were trying to attempt to free this truck so uh, the overpass could be open and then the interstate below could be open. And there was a little boy up around the top of the overpass riding his bicycle. He lived in a nearby neighborhood and he heard the clash and he... He uh, saw the crowd and he was like, man, what's going on? And he saw the truck underneath the overpass. And so he uh, saw some things there and he yelled out to the officer, the police officer down below. And he said, hey, Mr. Officer, I know how to get that truck out from underneath that bridge. The policeman heard him and he looked up at the boy, but then he ignored him because he saw his age and he just kind of blew him off a little bit. So the boy, he was wanting to help and, and, and he cried a little louder. He said, hey, Mr. Officer, I know how to get that truck out from underneath that bridge. And with a hint of irritation and some frustration and with his voice, he kind of looked up at that boy and he said, all right, boy. He said, uh, uh, how are you going to get this, uh, this truck out from underneath this bridge? And the boy, without any hesitation, said, let some air out of the tire." And of course, they immediately let air out of the tires and it freed that truck up and it went on down the road. I don't know if that tale is true or not. Either way, the story does not... It actually does teach a couple of important truths that we need to learn. First, it's easy to overlook the obvious even when it's staring you right in the face. But secondly, wise people learn to pay attention to all signs. The man failed to see the sign. Signs are very important in this physical world. I, I've missed a few turns myself. Matter of fact, uh, just the other day I was driving down, we live out in the country, and we live a, bu- a bunch of cow pastures and, and, and sharp turns and different uh, places. And so I'm a, a lover of signs. I love all kinds of signs. I've got a, a storage shed full of uh, old signs, oil cans and oil signs and gasoline signs, porcelain signs, and, and I like them old signs, the nostalgic. Well, I'll see any sign, so I saw a speed limit sign laying about 60 feet from the pole. And somebody had walloped the speed limit sign and failed to do the speed limit and uh, lost control and in the curve hit this sign and it was laying out in the field and I picked it up and put it in my shed. And uh, I don't think they were going to do that or anything. And of course, my tax money is what probably paid for it. So uh, anyway, uh, I don't think I'll get in trouble for it, but I put it in my sign. I didn't steal it. Don't, don't, don't get to... And, uh, but it was. Somebody hit it. You can see where they bent it up. You should have seen the, the pole. It was in pretty bad. Matter of fact, I was traveling not too long ago. And, uh, well, it was a few years ago, my wife will tell you. And uh, I was up through the, uh, Virginia going somewhere to preach. And I stopped at a Love's truck stop. How many of you love Love's trucks? I mean, I love truck stops. Something about truck stops are awesome. You can buy anything you want there. And uh, they're great, you know, got good food. They got uh, all kinds of stuff there. And so uh, I love truck stops. We stopped in there. Well, it was a Love's truck stop up in Virginia. And uh, somebody had hit the Love's truck stop sign and knocked it completely down. And Jacob, you might have been with me. I said, Jacob, go grab that sign. (laughs) I mean, it was just laying in the middle of the, you know, and it was broke. And they weren't going to use it. I said, Jacob, go get it. And we threw it in the back of it. So I got home. We had this Love's truck stop, a truck sign in the back of my... And Rebecca's like, what are you going to do? I said, this is going to be a place of love. And it says, you can park here, Love's truck stop. So in, the, in, the, in our building, we have parking for Love's truck stop right there. And somebody had just plowed it and broke the sign, and we kind of put it back together. And so uh, pole and all, it was great. And uh, so I love signs. I, I, I don't always look for them, but sometimes they find me, like this guy. 30 mile an hour, somebody didn't really pay much attention to the sign, but they, they, they found out real quick that uh, that they wasn't doing the speed limit. And it looked like they hit a fence and plowed through a field, got back on the... I mean, buddy, somebody was doing pretty fast or drunk or something. And they hit the sign. And I was thinking, man, somebody's not paying attention to the sign right in front 
of them. Well, you know, it kind of spawned a, a thing here in the, just these few verses here that Jesus was actually standing in front of these Pharisees and he's, these Pharisees. Look at verse 11 again. Notice what happens. He enters into the ship. He goes to the other side of this uh, of parts of uh, Dalmanutha. And he says this in verse 11. And the Pharisees came forth and began to question with him, seeking of a sign from heaven, tempting him. So the first thing we come to is a stern demand. These Pharisees, and we know what they are. The Pharisees are just a bunch of uh, religious, conservative uh, legalistic men that have the outside cleaned up, but the inside is nothing but filth and vileness and lost and empty. And, and they're wanting to question Jesus. Now, that questioning, if you notice that phrase, they begin to question with Him. The word question there means to dispute or argue. And the word is a tense that suggests that they just wouldn't shut up. They wouldn't go away. Jesus is standing there. He done fed the 4,000 people. They're probably still wiping the crumbs off their mouth. And these Pharisees, uh, when He gets off the ship, these Pharisees come and they approach Him and they say, Hey, we want to see a sign. We want you to do something so we'll believe that you really are who you say you are. And they wouldn't go away. Here's what they said. They said, uh, uh, we want you to uh, show them a sign from heaven. The Bible says that they were tempting Him in verse 11. And that is that they were putting Him to the test. Now here's what they were doing. They were trying to get Jesus to prove His authority and His source of of power. Now, if they had just been present just a minute ago where Jesus had took some loaves and two small fishes and He fed 4,000 people, they could have seen that this man is not some regular man. This is Jesus. After all, we know Jesus is of God. And there surely He could, this is what they're saying, surely He could do some wonder in the sky above and, and prove what He is. And other men of God, they went back to the Old Testament. I'm no doubt in my mind, these men went back to the Old Testament. They said, well, Joshua did something. If you go back to Joshua chapter 10, verses 12 through 14, Joshua actually commanded the sun to be still, and the sun obeyed. Now, we know who was behind all that. God was behind all that. But the Pharisees didn't know. They said, if Joshua did it, surely Jesus can do it. Well, you know, they probably said, Samuel prayed during a battle and the Lord answered with a strong and loud thunder and it confounded the enemy. So if Samuel prayed and God sent a great thunder, surely Jesus could do it. Or how about Elijah? Elijah prayed and it, it didn't rain on the earth for three and one half years. Imagine that. That's in the Old Testament. So these Pharisees, of course, they had memorized the Old Testament and they followed these Old Testament prophets and these Old Testament patriarchs and they thought, well, surely if Jesus is the Son of God, then He could stop the sun. He could do something. Others had done different things in the past to prove that they are from the Lord. And what these men were really trying to do was to get Jesus to promise more than He could deliver. They wanted to trip Him up. They knew all the things that He had done with people, casting out demons and multiplying food. They were trying to get Him to attempt a miracle and fail so that they could denounce that He was a actually false prophet. They were also saying that all the things that Jesus had already done in the power of God were insufficient. Now think about all that Jesus had already done. Jesus had, uh, he had healed the sick. He had raised the dead. He had delivered people from the bondage of demon possession. He had walked on the water. He had calmed the storm. Twice he had multiplied a meager meal and fed literally tens of thousands of people. Jesus had opened up the Word of God. He had brought it to life. He was teaching it and all that could hear it could hear it plainly. And the people were talking about Him. Here's what they said about Jesus. They said in Mark chapter 2, verse 12, We never saw it on this fashion. That's about Jesus. The Pharisees, though, they didn't, that wasn't enough for them. They said, hey, this is what they said about Jesus. He had done all things well, Mark chapter 7. So the Pharisees had heard enough gospel to save the world, but yet it wasn't good enough for them. That's a danger. We still have Pharisees with us today. 
We still have people who demand to see something sensational before they commit to following Christ. People thrive on the sensational. Why do you think people like Benny Hinn succeeds today? It's not his hair. Not the white suit. Not him blowing his bad breath on people. Knocking them out. They love, listen, they love the sensational. Getting in front of a big crowd and a man walking up there limping and now Benny Hinn throws something on him and hits him. They fall down. They get up there running around. People's like, oh! That's what they wanted. Jesus, do something crazy. Just do something so crazy that we'll believe you. We need a sign. Far too many people are waiting on some supernatural proof uh, that the existence of God. The fact is that God has already proven that He exists. While the world is looking for a sign, God tells us that He is visible in the ordinary things of the world. The things we take for granted every day are the very things that God, prove that God's real. Consider the heavens. Psalms chapter number 19 and verses 1 through 4. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth His handiwork. Day unto day utter the speech and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them hath He set a tabernacle for the sun. Think about the handiwork of our God. Uh, we had a group yesterday come back from the Creation Museum. No doubt they could leave that museum thanking God for His creation. Man, only God could do this. Only God could do this. But hold on a second. I did a little research. I, I, it's been a lot while since I've been to science class. Many of you as well. Science was not your favorite subject, nor was it I. But I know this, I know that science proves that God is who He says He is. See, our earth is traveling around on its own axis at 1,000 miles an hour. It moves around the sun at 67,000 miles per hour. It is carried by the sun across our galaxy at a speed of 64,000 miles per hour. It moves in orbit around our galaxy at 481,000 miles per hour. It travels through space, listen to this, at 1,350,000 miles per hour. God created that. Every 24 hours we cover 57 million 360,000 miles. Each year we travel 20 billion 936 Mil oh my goodness, I've never seen a, a, a one that big. 20,936,400,000 miles across empty space. Every moment in the billions of galaxies in the universe occurs with the precise split second timing. Consider the vastness of the universe. It is so vast that it takes a beam of light which travels some 700 million miles per hour or 186,411 miles per second over 100,000 years just to cover the length of our galaxy. The Milky Way in our galaxy is one of only many billions in the known universe. Imagine it this way. Just putting it on a perspective, when I read this just this week, I thought, man, we have no idea. Consider how... Uh, imagine uh, uh, kind of putting it on, plain, I guess, a plain field. If I had an orange up here this morning, was holding an orange, and then we had a little grain of sand in the earth, that just one little grain... And it was circling. The orange represents the sun. The little grain of sand represents the earth. And we took that grain of sand from this orange and walked 30 feet and began to circle that orange. That would be earth and the sun, the distance. Then we consider the planet Pluto. I don't know if Pluto's still a planet, but they shouldn't have messed with Pluto. Pluto was a planet when I was a kid. Don't unplanet planets. I don't know who sits around and gets paid to not consider Pluto planets. That kind of ticked me off a little bit when I read that last night. Whoever doesn't think Pluto... And if you don't think Pluto's a planet in here, 
You need to get right with the Lord. Pluto, the most remote planet in the solar system, is another grain of sand. You think about that. Take another grain of sand. You've got Earth at 30 feet away from the sun. You take another grain of sand circling the orange at 10 city blocks away. That would be from here to Lowe's Hardware. Then you take the fourth thing, the Alpha Centauri, which is the nearest star. So you've got Earth 30 feet away. You've got, you've got to Pluto, who's still a planet. He's, at, uh, he's 10 city blocks away, down at Lowe's in Cracker Barrel. probably at Cracker Barrel, and uh, down that way. And then you have the Alpha Centauri, the nearest star, is 1,300 miles away from the orange. That means that little grain of sand from this orange that I hold in my hand would be in Denver, Colorado. That's how big the universe really is. Now for those that would say, yeah, well all that happened on accident, it takes more faith to believe the evolution theory than it does to believe God created. We consider how small our universe is. All matter of the universe is made up of atoms. You learned that in, in, in the uh, science class. And there are uh, many atoms on the head of an ink pen. Take out an ink pen, you get the, the head there, and you look at that and you think, well, how many atoms could fit on the head of an ink pen? There are so many atoms on the head of an ink pen that if an army marched past four abreast, every soldier carrying one atom it would take that army 20,000 years to march past. Oh, we serve a big God who made a big universe, but also the little things. Oh, yeah, well, the fact is, a lot of people say, yeah, but I need more. You ever just walked out on your porch and looked out, or maybe, maybe, just, maybe you visited on vacation, you went somewhere and you just looked out, and you just looked up into the heavens. Maybe it was a beautiful day. Maybe you looked at night and seen all the stars. I don't know about your house, but I know we don't have uh, hardly anybody around us much, so there's no street lights. And you walk out there in the middle of our yard on a clear night, maybe in the fall or the winter, and you look up there and you can just see those stars. You see that moon and you almost reach out and grab one. Boy, it's beautiful. How could you say there is no God? Oh, that just happened to fall into place. Oh, no, friend. God said you can declare the, my existence in my handiwork. And we see these fact is that these signs and many more are proof and positive of God's existence to reject God and to reject His Word while you claim to be waiting for a sign is nothing more than rebellion against God according to Romans chapter 1. If you're looking for a sign today, look no further than Calvary. Hey, if you're looking for a sign today, uh, look to the cross and God's love for sinners in Romans chapter 5. If you're looking for a sign today, hey, look no further than the empty tomb. Hey, I was just there a few months ago and I peeped my head inside and guess what? He's not there. Hey, if you need a sign, you know, if I would have went to the tomb and they said, here lies the body of Jesus uh, from this date to this date. Hey, and we could have said, well, He's in there and we hate that. Hey, but can I tell you, that stone was rolled away and up from the grave He arose. I don't need a sign. Hey, He's living today. If you need a sign pointing to God, hey, look at the Bible you have in your lap. It has survived attack after attack of God. And can I tell you, it clearly points to the way of salvation. If you're looking for a sign to prove uh, the claims of the Bible and the Lord are real, just look around you at the lives that's been changed. We see a solemn declaration. Look at verse number 12. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and saith, why doth this generation seek after a sign? Verily I say unto you, there shall no sign be given unto this generation. When Jesus hears their demand, their questioning, it grieved His soul. You know, that word sigh means a, a groaning in His soul. He, it was frustration, perhaps a little bit of anger. And He questions, He says, why doth this generation seek after a sign? Hey, this was a question born out of amazement. After all, that generation had the greatest sign in the midst. Right there stood Jesus Himself. But we don't have that sign today. Uh, we're living by faith. And we have to look at uh, uh, what Jesus did in the past. We have the Word of God. Hey, there they had the Word of God in the flesh. And they still missed it. Jesus said, 
He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. John 14, 9. But when men looked at Jesus, what did they see Jesus as instead of the Father? They saw Him as a devil. Mark chapter 3, they said He was a son of the devil, a son of Beelzebub. Jesus, the, these generations, John chapter four, uh, 1 and verses 1 through 14, the generation had seeking after a sign and they could not come to the truth that was standing right in front. And this is how John even describes Jesus, that He was God and in the beginning was the Word. Hey, He said right off the bat, the first verse in, He says, the Word of God was made flesh. Hey, He is the Word. Jesus is the Word of God. Hey, Jesus said that if you've seen Me, you've seen the Father. And that generation had all the signs, but they failed to see the truth. Can I, there's a couple of things that I got out of this. The first thing was signs. When a sign is given, another sign is desired. So when someone sees a sign, they say, well, if that's one sign, I guess there's got to be another sign. The second thing I got out of it was signs don't save, faith does. So Jesus could have done all the signs imaginable and it still would have never saved one single person. Salvation is not in a sign. Salvation is in faith. When faith touches grace, the greatest miracle of all, salvation of a human soul takes place. Hey, Jesus isn't a sign business. He's in the salvation business. And if you're waiting for a Damascus Road experience before you come to Jesus, you'll probably be waiting a long time. He did that for Paul. Most folks don't get the, the dog and pony show. Most folks are convicted of their sins, drawn to Jesus, and called upon to respond in Him by simple faith. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. There's not going to be a light shining on you from heaven. Hey, there's not going to be something writing in, uh, written in the sky. There's going to be something that's going to happen that's just going to make the earth quake, and you're just waiting on it. Then I'll get saved. Hey, friend, the signs have already took place. Here's what the Lord is trying to tell you today. There shall be no sign given to this generation. The third thing I come to and the last thing is this. Verse 13, which is a very sad verse. And he left them and entering into the ship again departed to the other side. The words of verse 13 are amongst the saddest in this whole, really this whole Mark, uh, book of Mark in, in the Gospel. And he left them. There was nothing more to say. It didn't say that the Pharisees left Jesus. It says that Jesus actually left the Pharisees. Those men experienced the wrath of God's abandonment. He turned them over to their own ways and left them in their darkness. What a horrible thought. But that is just what the Lord does. In Romans chapter 1, you can read about that. He will not deal with you forever. Genesis chapter 6, He said, My spirit will not always strive with man. Sometimes I believe if you keep missing the sign and keep missing the sign and keep missing it and you keep seeing or you know looking for things and you're just looking for it in all the wrong places, my friend, one day the Holy Spirit of God will stop dealing with you. You're right. God has been speaking to you this morning about being saved. You need to get saved. Quit looking for something. Well, if they sing this song on this certain day, then I'll walk forward. Or if this preacher preaches, or if they preach out of this particular book, or if they sing this special, or if, if it's not raining outside, or if it's real sunny and about 71 degrees, then I'll... No, hold on a second. We don't need all that. Friend, I believe today is the day of salvation. I can't scare you into it, but I can tell you this, that if you don't come to Christ today and believe on Him for salvation, you'll spend eternity in a devil's hell. I would dare say, and I'm not, I can't say this to be sure because I'm not sitting in their seats today, but I would dare say that in Greenville County today on Sunday morning, there's only been just a handful of churches, if that, that will even mention hell. They'll even mention it because it's not popular. Nobody wants to hear, hey, if you miss God, you go to hell. 
We know the false religions. We know that, that that's not a very popular subject. I mean, you just think about it in your mind. When's the last time you heard someone just rear back and preach a whole message on eternity and hell? It's not popular. Nobody enjoys it. If you enjoy preaching on hell, something's wrong with you. It's not, it's not fun. It's not exciting. You're not going to get people walking out patting you on the back saying... Good message today. Real encouraging, preacher. That ain't, that's not happening. So you know what? Most men avoid the subject of hell. But here's the deal. There's no way to avoid it if Jesus is the only way. See, there's many ways to hell. There's only one way to heaven. There'll be many people that will go... See, there's, look at me, church. Look at me real quick. All of you, teenagers included. There's no further distance from the bar stew to hell than the Baptist pew to the hell. No, the, well, I didn't get... I, I, you're going to hell because you've been drinking and been smoking dope. And been, hey, honestly, I'd rather go to hell from there than go from the church pew. There's kids growing up in preacher's home worse than the devil. Don't believe, rejecting God. Ah, whatever my dad believed, I say, whatever mama believed, I don't want that. The whole time, they're looking at mom and daddy's religion and they're missing Jesus. I grew up in, listen, I grew up in a preacher's home and, and was raised in church. I'm talking about from the first time I was able to go to church as a baby. My mama took me, took me nine months before I was born. I was in church, mama raised, hey, praying, daddy preaching, all I ever knew, but I had to get it for myself. The signs, hey, hey, listen, I saw them all over the place. I, man, I was in church. Everything I did my whole life revolved around church. But the danger of that is I can look in all the wrong places and miss Jesus. See, you know, church, how is it... We, we talk about the Pharisees, but the disciples were just as bad. The disciples are the ones that said, Jesus, how are you going to feed all these people out here when there's nothing out here really to eat? When just a few chapters earlier, Jesus took a much smaller meal and fed more people. How, how, how we, God, how are you going to provide that? How are you going to make a way? Don't you believe that I'm God? Man, I, and I'll be, I'll be the first to admit, church, listen to me. I'll be the first to admit that I struggle just like you do sometimes. God has done all them things in my heart. Done, God has done all them things in my life, and yet I'm looking for something else. And He's just standing right there saying, You know what, son? I ought to slap you upside the head. Many times you've seen me do this. As many times you've seen me do that. As many times you've seen me save souls. As many times as you've seen me heal people and do things. And here you are questioning me. What are you doing? What are you doing? You're, you're, looking, you're looking in the wrong place. You're not paying attention. I am who I say I am. I want to ask you this morning is this, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, won't you come to Him today before, while there's time, before it's too late? Come to Jesus and be saved. Come to Jesus today. You still looking for a sign? Let me show you a couple signs that I found this week that you probably know. There's a sign that reads like this, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son... That whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He that believeth on Him is not condemned, but he that believeth is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Here's another sign that I found just a few chapters over. John chapter 6, verse 35, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you, that ye also have seen me and believe not. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Here's one more sign in case you missed those two. John six forty seven. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. There's many more signs in the Bible if you're interested. 
And every single one of them is found right here in God's Word. Not in a book I'm going to suggest. No, all we, all we need is the Word of God. And, and I know it's pertaining more to salvation today, but some would say, imagine a driver traveling down a highway, passing a sign, and after this sign telling him that the bridge over the river is out, and the water's done wash the bridge out, and please stop, turn around, uh, the, the road ends, please stop. And the, the, the driver just keeps ignoring the signs and he only plunges into the river and ignoring all the signs and he dies. You might say this morning, preacher, no one would ever do that. Oh no. Isn't that just what a lot of people are doing? You're speeding down the road of life. You're speeding toward death. You don't know when that day's coming. The Bible says in Hebrews 9, 27, it's appointed that a man wants to die. But after this, the judgment... It'll be too... Listen, church, look at me. It'll be too late to look at the signs then. Yeah, I must have missed that sign. It's appointed unto man wants to die. I must have missed that. I don't care if you've been in this church for years or you're just brand new to this church. Someone is in need of Jesus. Someone is. Someone. Someone needs to heed the warnings of, of hell. Someone needs to heed the warnings. Jesus was standing right in front of those Pharisees and even the disciples. And all Jesus was trying to do by proving these miracles and showing these miracles was to show the Jews that He is the Messiah. And they would not heed. And you know what Jesus did? He left. Jesus left. You know what I believe Jesus is doing today in a lot of churches? He's leaving. He's not welcome. You know what Jesus is doing in a lot of families today? He's walking out. Hey, He stands at the door and knocks. Revelation chapter 2, right? He's not knocking on the heart of a, of a lost person trying to get in. He's knocking on the heart of the church. Hey, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear my voice, open the door. I'll come in and sup with him and he with me and we'll just have fellowship if you'll just let me. I need to come in. I'm the sign. I'm the one. Hey, quit looking for everything. You know what the church said though? Uh, we're in need of nothing. We've got it all. Je Jesus, we're, you know, we're good. We've got it all, man. We're growing and we've got padded pews and air conditioning and we've got, we've got all the stuff that we need. We've we got money and we've got it all. And Jesus, we don't need you. You can just stand there and knock. You know what Jesus is going to do? He's going to go away. Church, if you were invited to something and when you got there you didn't feel welcome, Maybe someone invited you to supper and maybe you got there and they just wouldn't talk to you and didn't really have nothing set out for you. and You just, they just, you just felt like they, you were bothering them. You wouldn't stay long, would you? I wouldn't. I remember one time I was preaching somewhere and the preacher said, hey, you want to grab a bite to eat after the service? And it wasn't late. I don't like it when it's 10 minutes before closing and you got 14 people walking in. Um, you know, the, the waitresses don't like that either. And uh, they want to go home. So usually if it's a little amount of time, I'll say, you know what, we're just going to find something on the road through a drive through And Because uh, I've been on the other side of that. I waited tables my way through college. And I hated it when someone came in last. You say, well, you're open till 10 o'clock, aren't you? Yeah, and I can also do something to your food. No, I'm not. And uh, <laughs> never did that. Anyway, uh, but that, they can, so don't, 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 don't make them mad. So usually I'll say, you know what? We're just going to go on down the road, go through a drive through and we'll find some food, and uh, I ain't going to bother anybody and let them go home. So uh, we were walking into a restaurant. It was probably maybe 30 minutes. 30 minutes, is, I can eat. 30 minutes, we can leave. We'll, we'll be good. Eat something simple, and uh, we'll be on our way. Well, I walked in. The, the, the hostess there, she rolled her eyes. That wasn't a good sign. They must have had a rough day that day. I'm not sure. Maybe it was a long day. And 
So she immediately, when she saw, it was just me and another preacher. It wasn't a big party, just two people. And, I, and, and, and immediately when she saw the door open and looked and we were walking in and we were just kind of, you know, trying to be courteous and, and not buy, what time do you close? Oh, we'll make sure we got plenty of time. Oh, okay. Uh, she rolled her eyes and didn't say nothing, grabbed some menus. And uh, you need some crayons, you know. No, she didn't do that. And, uh, but, uh, you know, we sat down, we were going to eat. And, uh, man, the, the, the waitress was upset. It just looked like... And I told the preacher, I said, listen, before we order, we might want to rethink this. They don't want us to come. He said, you know what? I got that feeling too. I said, you want to just go somewhere else? You know what we ended up? Waffle House, because they'll take anybody. <laughs> can I get a witness? You can fight and kill each other, and they're still going to serve you. And you can watch it happen. Always welcome at Waffle House. We went to Waffle House and had good fellowship. Hey, you know why? We left and we were polite. We didn't make it. We just left because we did not feel welcome. Don't you think Jesus feels the same way? Feels the same way. Hey, them people, they're not welcoming to me. Here I am. I've done all these things for them. I've, I've done all this and they're still looking for something. Else. The sensational. Let's stop looking for the sensational and start looking to the Savior. Not every service is going to be sensational. You know? I know churches right now that everything's got to be up here all the time. Nobody came to the altar today. We must be losing God's power. Did you preach the Word? Did you pray? Did you, did you do what you're supposed to do? Yeah. Well, then stop looking for sensational and just do and be obedient. If God sends a bunch of people on the altar, if God fills your bus, if God fills your class, hey, but here's the deal. Are you praying? Are you preaching the Word? Are you loving sinners? Are you doing your part? Quit looking for the big and just look to God. That's what He wanted them to do.